Hello everyone and thank you for listening into the Pen, the Sword, and Tabletop Roleplay Games. Uh, my name is Lady of Knives or Victoria and my guests are as followed. Uh, Shannon, Aprexis, and Morks. If you guys want to give any other names, uh, go ahead. None? Okay. Nope. Oh, that would be fine for me. Um... So today we have the topic of a very iconic uh, character. Um, he has many names, such as the Feaster from Afar, the Unspeakable One, him who is not to be named, the King in the Pallid Mask, the Great Dreamer's Arch Nemesis, the Yellow Sign, the God of Shepherds, or the King in Yellow, aka Haster. Um, so, I just got on a Call of Cthulhu kick, <laughs> and I'm actually surprised about how much I like it. Um, how how much have you guys been introduced to the either Call of Cthulhu or the Lovecraftian uh, pantheon, so to speak? I only know what Morx has introduced me to. Ironically enough, not all that much. But I did get, my introduction to the Yellow King himself was actually from this, like, 4chan story, or the story from 4chan that focused around a kind of cult he had in a game. Okay. I introduced Morks to it once. It was the story of Old Man Henderson. Uh, what was it? Can you give a brief overview about it? Brief overview is that... Basically, it's this asshole DM, and one of the players creates this batshit in insane PC in order to basically screw over and derail his entire Call of Cthulhu campaign. Okay. And, um, uh, there was some hints to Haster and Season 2 of Sam's, uh, June campaign. Um, the Yellow Sign, uh, Haster, the Mad God, and, but... I've seen, for, from season one plus season two, there's definitely been Cthulhu mythos. There has been a lot, yeah. Shubnigrath, uh, what's the one that you guys fought for the final boss? Can't say I remember him nearly as well as the one we fought on Tuesday, actually. Yeah, I can't remember which one we fought. Oh, uh, it was the Great Deep One. The Great Deep One? Okay. It was just a really big horror terror. It wasn't the name of Kraken Horror. But like, in a way, that's where I kind of got my interest, and it was by uh, some sort of luck that uh, I was pulled into a Call of Cthulhu game, and now, like, I want Call of Cthulhu stuff for Christmas and stuff like that. Well, I, uh, I'm the Morks guy, and most of the people here were introduced to Lovecraftian themes by me. And uh, I think it's, it's kind of ironic that there would be any kind of podcast about Lovecraftian monsters at all. Because the main draw of them, the main thing that people want from Lovecraft and that theme, is cosmic horror. And the whole point of cosmic horror is the great unknown. So if you're explaining away the Yellow King too much, if you're giving him detail... Either you need to make him into a character in your campaign that the other characters can directly interface with, because according to some of the non-Lovecraft authors works with him, he's the only benevolent member of the Lovecraftian outer pantheon. He's the only one that doesn't immediately try to take advantage of and abuse, and sometimes even keep. In fact, um, I th uh, from a little bit of research uh, that I did today and for the past couple of days, is that he's actually no physical threat. He tends to be more a psychological threat. To he does himself. relish in making people go insane. Mm -hmm. um, but people also think that he might just be a reflection of Naira Lethotep. So it's, it, it, it really is completely up to the person using the Lovecraftian monsters, how the Yellow King even fits in. Because mm. so many different monsters in Lovecraft are exactly the same monster. And a lot of people think that uh, the Yellow King isn't even the Yellow King, that it's just a, a manifestation of Cthulhu's dreaming. And that Cthulhu is a self-hating monster just like the rest of us, and the Yellow King is his conscience. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot of different ways that it can go. 
And there's no right or wrong answer because Lovecraft himself even says that he has no idea what most of the monsters even do. And that, well, that that's the whole point. These cosmic horrors are beyond human comprehension. So the more they are attempted to explain, like the, the best advice I could give you is if you've got Lovecraftian monsters and the players have predicted what you're going to do with them, either go through with it and make it as horrible as possible or do something else. Yeah. Like completely. Bad gods and their motive for Mm hmm. If you guys want a little bit of backstory and stuff to read on them, uh, Lovecraft was not the first person to actually write about Haster. Um, the book uh, was written first by Ambrose Bierce uh, um, in 1893. Um, though he wasn't mentioned in it first, uh, the first book was An Inhabitant of Carcosa. And then the second book was Hadia the Shepherd, which was the first mentioning of Haster. Um, the person to kind of make it a little bit famous was Robert W. Chambers, who followed uh, the book uh, with The Yellow King in 1895. Lovecraft took over it uh, in 1931 with Whispers in the Dark, Darkness. The Whisper in the Dark. Uh, the Whisper in Darkness, yes. Sorry, my notes. And then that one actually officially links the yellow sign to Haster. And then Raymond Chandler did uh, The King in Yellow again in 1938. And Joseph Payne Benin uh, wrote The Feaster from Afar in 1976. Um, and it's, it's just amazing how much of a free character he is to use. Because as as said by many people that it, it's basically an artistic uh, uh, present to anybody who wants to really use it. Sort of. It, it wasn't meant as a gift. Uh, Lovecraft was a weird fucker. Yeah. So he wasn't thinking like, oh gosh, wouldn't it be great if all of us could just be friends and share this great thing? No, he was trying to scare people. He used to obsess walking around with a notepad uh, trying to find the most repulsive names he could think of and add them into his books. Like he, he was a weird dude, and not just because he was horribly racist against black people, Mexicans, and well, basically anyone who wasn't a straight white male from Rhode Island. Yeah. Which, by the way, he was. <laughs> uh, he was horribly unsuccessful in love. He was married. His wife hated him. He, I mean, he, he just had some of the worst situations in life. He got into one of the best schools of his age and he flunked out because he said he had too delicate of a constitution for math. Oh my god. Yeah, so like, like Lovecraft was kind of just a fuck up, really. Like he, he was a failure of a man abjectly from start to finish until he struck, he, he bottled lightning with some of his books. He was able to actually really freak out. Out. And then, more so, his original weird ter uh, tales for, like, the winged horrors, he really started to take off when he started selling the newspaper. Uh, and, and his whole thing was, he didn't decide to take ownership of his characters or his themes. He instead expanded it because he had been pulling characters and themes from other works. So instead of copywriting everything, he created a mythos that his entire circle of, well, we'll call them friends because it's, he didn't really have friends outside of people who wrote his mythos with him. There's another kind of sad thing about Lovecraft. The only associates he really had other than his wife who said that they did not like each other and that his wife even him occasionally. <laughs> he had a cat, though. Oh, God. He did have a cat. The the cat, cat loved that cat had a horrible name. Um, but he also had other influences. Like, you can't deny that he had a huge influence from Edgar Allan Poe in his work Beyond the Wall of Sleep. So the guy pulled from everywhere. And as a result, he didn't, he did the one positive moral decision in his life where he decided that he, could, he couldn't charge people for stuff he stole. And so he just opened it up and had other people join. And he'd even support other people's works using his character. Like, oh yeah, it's totally what would happen. I love that. The thing was, 
Lovecraft, despite all of the horrible things about him, despite being an, a Jew-hating, racist, Polak, racial slur using, just like a messed up kind of person of the time, he was actually pretty uh, pretty generous with his team, so long as you were a striped white male from Rhode Island, which was most of the people he allowed to write about his stuff. Yeah, so naturally you have these characters coming out of this strange person. And I think a lot of the original cosmic horror of Lovecraft comes from people's inability to understand just how weird Lovecraft himself was. Not weird in a cosmic way, just weird in that he was a loner. He was socially strange. And... I mean, I don't think any of us can really understand a guy whose coping mechanism, once he's outcast by everyone in his life, is to write about great cosmic outer horrors. Like, that's that's an interesting way to get people to be your friend. But uh, it worked for Lovecraft, and it can work for your D&D campaign. Very much so. so. So on the nature of Pastor and Cthulhu, an important thing to note, just if you want to stick with the, the Lovecraft lore on him, is you don't have to make them the same entity, but you do have to make them enemies. Aster and Cthulhu always hate each other. And it's kind of hard to understand why, other than Cthulhu being an evil people eater and Aster being a somewhat benevolent people shepherd. Uh, the thing is, they're both causing people to go insane and kill themselves. It's not like one of them's good or bad. It's competition that makes them hate each other. There's a limited number of humans to make go insane, and Cthulhu wants them all, and so does Haster. So naturally, they kill each other out. Or they're trying to kill each other off so they can have 100% of that resource. Um, I've also, uh, I have a theory about that, too, because in some sources it was said that Carcosa was uh, destroyed. And um, in Carcosa, Haster was uh, the, the god of shepherds, uh, a benevolent god. Um, but... Cthulhu is the destroyer of worlds, so what if Cthulhu actually went to Carcosa and destroyed it, and thus invoked a wrath of Haster? Uh, that would then have some kind of effect or ripple. Like, Cthulhu destroying a world is a, is a very big deal. The world doesn't exist after. You'd have to kind of take an example from the Yithians, and what happened there after the, the great, what is it, the great flying spores wiped them all out. Cthulhu is not a, a genocide kind of guy. He's he's an enslavement guy. He's not a destroyer. He's a dominator. Granted, he will destroy everything, but it's not like there won't be life once he does. It's just it's all going to be his kind of life. Mm -hmm. But with uh, with Haster, he's the only one other than Nyarlathotep who who seems to find actual use from humans. And I, I keep referencing Haster and Nyarlathotep in the same breath because they frankly. Very similar character. In the Call of Cthulhu game that uh, Shannon just joined with uh, me, um, the DM's name is Glenn. Uh, we are playing uh, what the title is, The Masks of Nyarlathotep. And um, we, we visited the uh, Father Maggot, and that was really interesting. Um, he's also known as the Crawling Chaos. Uh, he's got quite a few... I think Nyarlathotep actually has, um, a lot more names than the ones that I've heard of. Is that true, Sam? Yes, definitely. But the, the, there's no lack of names for an infinite mythical entity. You can just make them up on the spot as long as they sound past it. Like the King of Maggots, I haven't heard that one before. Um, it's linked with the Karasari, uh, folklore of Peru. Uh, Karasari are fat-sucking vampires, and the way that they reproduce is, uh, they feed people maggots, which is actually very, very disgusting, in my personal opinion, and they turn into the Karasari. Gross. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, I was dealing with the um, Hills of Madness, I was doing the Starborn, because oh. cosmic horror... Sure, everyone's afraid of the Mind Flayer Parasite, so you can just rework that. Great. Um, or you could rework the Corpse Worm Plague, which is even better, I think, than the Mind Flayer Maggots, which require Mind Flayers to stick them in your ear, whereas a Corpse Worm can just jump at you. Oh, is that what was in Season 2? Uh, no, no, it's going to be what's in Season 3. It's a sneak peek into Athos. Oh... But the thing is, it's, it's better to have a, a system of conversion that happens either passively or actively in a way that is 
horribly un understandable and unavoidable. Yeah, See, you know that it's, it's these, they feed you a maggot. There was no description of the maggot. It's not a special maggot. It's just a maggot. So then you have to be fed one by one of these fat suckers, or it, does anyone who eat a maggot become one? Oh, it's That's actually uh, uh, because these the Kirasari are um, vampires that are also decaying inside, so they're actually built up of these maggots. And they're supposed to be really huge, and it's uh, really gross. Um, but, that uh, just sound like rot beans to me. Is that a so they're actually they're not a Lovecraftian enemy. Ah. Uh. Not to say that undead can't be Lovecraftian enemies. For instance, if you're doing adventure where you have the, uh, what is it, the Necromancer from the Necronomicon, the old World War I officer that was a major uh, that used to revivify the dead, and then once he succeeded in revivifying someone, he started just partially revivifying them and grafting lizard flesh onto them. Basically, it was an army doctor that figured out how to bring people back from the dead. And once he got bored of bringing a bunch of World War I veterans back to the dead, he started bringing them back as horrors, like horrible undead zombie creatures with very specific purposes, like a shelf of heads that only memorized parts of his formulas for him, headless creatures that would do his bidding as an assistant, all kinds of crazy things. And that was just what happens when a human comes into contact with something that is a truly cosmic horror. When we're focusing on Lovecraft, we don't want to focus on stuff we understand. The best thing is to take something simple and make it completely strange and ununderstandable. So, in the case of that necromancy, right? If we got necromancy in D&D. You can just resurrect dead bodies and have a whole zombie thing. Why was Lovecraft's necromancy so horrifying? Well, I'll tell you. It's because that fluid he was using for the resurrection... It was indescribable. It was just like the color from space, where there was just a new color, and it was like nothing ever seen before. There was no one who knew what this mixture was, and there were implications that he got the mixture from a source beyond the stars. So, again, it's that cosmic horror. It's something from beyond the outer planes. It's inconceivably far away. And there is no chance that you'll ever learn anything about it to understand how to use it or manipulate it. This one guy knows everything about it, and he's using it, and it's doing disgusting, horrible, unexplainable things to the people he's doing it to. Now that is cosmic horror. And if you're explaining things, you're not you're not giving him cosmic horror. You're just giving them kind of normal horror with a hint of Lovecraft. How the fuck are you supposed to make anyone scared of a color? <laughs> you make them go insane if they look at it. Um. I don't remember. Also, you put it at the bottom of a well, so there's a good chance they throw themselves in to kill themselves after. <laughs> remember when Victoria wasn't saying that she was afraid of the numbers? <laughs> no, it was not. Yeah, I don't like that. She didn't even know why she was afraid of six. She just was. You know, the thing is, is I thought I thought you told me you were afraid of number six, and so I was like, okay, number six. Well, it it didn't appear to me that. Uh, that I should look on the madness chart and look at number six. No, I was like, okay, I'm mad. Uh, I I have madness about the number six, and so yeah, that that was a special moment for me. I'd be worried. <laughs> it was. I'd be more worried about the number seven. You know that is very true. Why is uh, why does everyone seven has it? more significance in Lovecraft writing? Oh, does it? Yes, and actually it has to do with South American folklore, because it had a lot to do with how the Incans counted. You see, Lovecraft loved to pull from the myth of local cultures that no longer existed, so no one could, like, yell at him for misquoting or saying the wrong thing about them. And since there's very little about the Incan culture remaining, because of that whole Spanish genocide thing. Um. Good job, Columbo. Anyway, <laughs> uh, good, good. that happened. And now we don't know much about a lot of South American culture, which also has to do with why Lovecraft used so many South American folklore. I'd also like... Uh, let's talk about uh, his uh, very common uh, manifestation. I've heard... Oh, the Yellow Kings or Cthulhu's? His uh, 
the Yellow King. So, what I found common through some of my uh, uh, research was that uh, he had many forms. Many, many forms. But the uh, most common one that was uh, uh, described was a hunch figured and tattered and torn yellow robes wearing a featureless pallid or a uh, pale mask. Sometimes it said it was crowned or not. And then it had uh, tentacles of an octopus. Yep, standard for love. <clears throat> Lovecraft. That, that, when I was reading it, there was another one that was also as likely, which was basically just a big yellow tentacle beast. It was basically like his humanoid form, but far less humanoid. Yes. Much larger. And uh, something interesting that I saw, too, is the difference between Cthulhu and Haster is that Cthulhu is actually more squid-like, whereas Haster is more octopus-like. And I guess that is to try to draw the difference, once again, between the two. Uh, Lovecraft didn't know the difference. Oh, he didn't know the difference? No, he did not. Bless his heart. He repeatedly proved that he didn't. Bless his heart. Um, yeah, he just, he would occasionally walk by the, again, delicate constitution, the man would faint all the time, and he would walk by the pier, and it was such a horrifying experience for him, because just a gentle wafting of fish rot knocked him out. <laughs> he probably understood that one was bigger than the other, though. Or he left it open to interpretation, like he did with a lot of his characters, he waited for his uh, associates to flesh it out. Because again, there are some pretty heavy implications in some of the stories you can say that Neil Ethertep and the Yellow King are one and the same. Ben pointing out the King in Yellow might just be another mask worn by the real crawling horror. Mm -hmm. and it, it's very likely because they are very similar. They both shepherd and cause insanity in humans. They seem to be mostly anthropocentric, which means they ignore most other species. And that's a huge deal in the Lovecraftian universe because there are a million and a half more aliens that are way more entertaining than humans. Yeah, like, uh, this has, like, I have personally not read any of Lovecraftian's work, but now I just, I <laughs> really do want to. So, first thing I, I gotta recommend to, like, everyone that listens, too, if you're gonna do a Lovecraft campaign, or you want to understand more about the weirdness of Lovecraft, but you don't want to go through reading all of his scrawl, go on YouTube and look up the Necronomicon audio audiobook and just, just listen. It takes, uh, well, the, the first part takes two and a half hours, but even the first third of the book is a lot of material to go off. Like, the Necronomicon isn't just a, a big ritual book that's, that's meant to scare people. It's a collection of Lovecraft short stories. And uh, the idea is that all of those short stories are in the same universe, and it's all in this book written by a mad Arab, but it's actually written by him. And again, just, just pointing out the racism there, he says, it was written by a mad Arab. It's like, uh, can we say that? <laughs> then, it, <laughs> Anyways, moving on from that strange way to phrase it. Uh, yeah, you just read some of his works, and or have them read to you, since we have technology. It only takes really just a couple hours to get a good grasp on some of Lovecraft's most beloved themes. And those themes, I think, are, I mean, I recommend The Hills of Madness especially. Like, creatures that you are encountering that you never see as the player. So, that's far more terrifying than, say, a night hag. That you know what kind of a, an issue you're going to deal with with a night hag, but with, like, a starborn... You have a mining colony of a bunch of starborn living nearby. People just go missing. And if you mess with them, there's going to be scratches and strange like footmarks on your door. And you're going to wake up in places other than your house because they're going to be freaking mind controlling you in your dreams to bring you out to do experiments on you. Because they're so interested in humans that are mentally present enough to be able to see them. Because most humans don't even realize they're there. Um, oh, but if humans ever did figure out that they were there, they'd just blast the entire planet, because they're 100% within their, their means to do that, which is a distinguishing feature <clears throat> of the Yellow King and all of Lovecraft's enemies and the creatures he makes, is that they're not defeatable. They're not things that the players can These are the cosmic horrors. These are things that have been in the universe for infinite years, and it's irrelevant 
how they would live or die because they can't die. They will continue to be in some form or another forever. Sure, you can slay a couple of their minions. Maybe you can kill a starboard. Maybe you can kill a few yit. But you're still going to get wiped out. That cosmic force that is behind them, that whole race, they're going to come calling. And there's nothing you or even the combined might of every player you know and every fantasy village you've saved could do to stop them. That's part of the cosmic horror. Is here it comes, and it's so overwhelming, there's nothing you can do to stop. So think about that with Haster, too, is that at any point, despite being benevolent, he could snap and wipe out them, mm -hmm. just like his enemy. And what's really interesting, too, about some of Lovecraftian's mythos and Haster specifically is that uh, Haster can actually be referenced as supernatural events, places, and entities. So it doesn't actually have to be just a person. Because Haster sign is considered Haster. The method that Haster sign works off of is it makes Haster appear to be a mimetic monster. Which is to say that that yellow sign sort of scars his presence into the mind of everyone who sees it. And then the insanity that that it causes in their minds feeds him power. And he's often thought of almost like a patron of writers and artists and um, anyone who can create uh, quote unquote mad pieces of art. Yeah, but so is Cthulhu. So do they compete in that area too? I would imagine they would compete in everything they could. I mean, they are true enemies, even if they are the same person. Mm -hmm. And I, I've done just a little bit of research. I barely scratched the surface of it, and I know it. And it, it's just, like, beckoning me forward. It's like... I mean, isn't that always the case when you find a new obsession? <laughs> true. And I guess my obsessions do lie around tabletop roleplay games, so... Well, your obsession ought to draw you to reading the uh, base material. That would help a lot. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm actually finishing up the Necronomicon right now. I've been uh, listening to it between lessons and Latin. <laughs> Latin and Cthulhu. Nothing can go wrong with that, right? They do not go well together, actually. No. Remember how I said Lovecraft was not an educated man? He didn't know Latin. Not very well. He just knew a few like extra phrases, like of nothing, nothing. nothing. So. You, it sounds like you really like the Starborn out of all of them. Well, the Starborn are a great example, and the Yithians, of a Lovecraft race. Both of them were great intergalactic races at one point, who were beyond spaceships. They could travel with their physical bodies to any planet they wanted. They would come to Earth to occasionally mine metals and resources, and they still maintain some mining colonies. But the main point of them is that no one really knew what they looked like. In most Lovecraft enemies, there's some vague descriptions that people give, but really it's no more than if they'd seen some wild animal running around in the bushes. They can't actually put what they see to words, even if they do manage to see one. Like, these creatures are just beyond description. They're beyond knowing. But the Yithians aren't even in their original body. They're a race that has been genocided and chased from planet to planet so often that they've replaced their original bodies because they can psionically take over new bodies. Oh, by the way, that means a Yithian can take over your body during a game. Just saying, that's, that's awesome. Oh, and you know what the Yithians originally looked like? Because we do know what the Yithians originally looked like. What? So a Yithian is any individual that calls themselves a member of the great race of Yith. Uh, now, you might remember from Season 2, I made a wand called the Wand of Yith that had a very broken ability. Uh, for the sake of content, I won't tell people what it was, though. Because I'll get, I'll get some, how could you do that? <laughs> You'll break your campaign for people who don't know how resilient Dune is. Uh, but the great race was said to be nearly omniscient. Each member of them almost knew everything. So they, they had approximate knowledge on everything. Like, you'd walk up to them, and they'd already know your name and where you came from. They just wouldn't know exactly what your last job was. 
So uh, they, they decided to become interplanetary traders. And some of them decided to try to find the origins of the universe. Apparently, trying to find the origin of the universe dooms your species in Lovecraft because you end up interfering with one of the great old ones or, you know, Lovecraft forbid, as a thought. And then once you mess with that, you basically just go insane and die. Uh, which they did in the Cretaceous era, era about 66 million years ago on Earth. <laughs> so, yes. The Great Race of Yith is also like an alternate history. It's a, it's a historical fiction on Earth. And in fact, Lovecraft even goes further to say that in the histories of Earth alone, there are uncounted alien races who have risen and fallen on our very planet, and we simply live above them on this most recent layer of Earth. Which, I mean, considering his very limited knowledge of, of things like geology and volcanic activity and, and tectonic plates, he did a pretty good job of, of trying to imagine over how many years, like, the mantle would have shifted and we could have had entire civilizations just buried and never known about them. Like, what if they weren't even human? So Lovecraft made this whole mythology off of very believable curiosities that we even find real archaeologists have today. Like, what if there was a different ancestor? Or what if there were different sorts of races at certain levels of humanity? Now, we've... we've we're pretty conclusive that we've got a good a good gist of what kind of life we've had on the planet by now. But it is still a great question. Like, what if we decide to try and do a little archaeology on another planet? We might find stuff like uh, Lovecraft is theorizing here. We might find some race that was like ours, except they were... Let's, let's see how this is described. Uh, great three tentacled spore-like creatures with four antennae at the top and the bottom of their head and three eyes. One of their arm or two of their arms are equipped with claws and one is like a bunch of suction cups. Oh, and instead of legs, they just have a bell. They grow out of the ground like a mushroom. But they move somehow. It's not an actual mushroom. They're just a moving, living creature. And they can fly. They have bug wings. Is that how they move? I guess. <laughs> I, they're Yithian. I don't know. I've never seen one. <laughs> I... And if I did, I'd never admit it. After all, humans are not meant to get involved in the affairs of greater races. It's, as Lovecraft points out in all of his stories, it's a mortal mistake. It's just about everyone in his stories dies or goes insane. In, in just the worst kinds of ways. Oh my gosh. Yep, and that's what I'm reading while I'm preparing Athos. <laughs> oh lord. I won't be able to play that. So sad. Yeah, but I just might. Depends on my schedule. Yeah. It's it's so interesting. Uh, I love homebrew worlds so much more than I like uh, playing in like Faerun or I mean, Earth is okay just because you could do so much to it because we have so much experience with it. Like, to take urban fantasy to a whole new level. But even, like, oh. like that, uh, don't get specific about places or anything. Well, Earth is a shortcut. Like, Faerun, Eberron, all of the different lands that have been described in D&D. What do they all have in common? Homework. There's books and books and books that you have to read before you know all about them. Before you're really, really, like, 100% prepared for any question that's going to come from any kind of lore nerd on the side. It comes up to the player and is like, um, actually, my corn broccoli wouldn't be at the bar right now. Because at 2.30, he had a hair appointment. It's like, fuck you, dude. How did you know that? No, but um, using Earth as a way to borrow is a way to, to, to shortcut a lot of things. You, you have to do less homework because chances are you've already done a bunch of history homework in your real life. You can just take advantage of what you already know about history and read fewer books. It, uh, it rarely ends up working out that way because you'll always end up in a period of history where one of your players is a history buff on it. And you end up asking them a lot of questions. 
Uh, the Lovecraftian thing is fun. It's tough when you're using it in an Earth setting, though, because there is so much very specific. And I'm, I just want to point this out. There is very specific date and time information in the actual Lovecraft manual. He is OCD about describing almost perfectly the time, the date, and the location of all the things that take place. And he does them sometimes in the form of correspondences and letters and, like, package deliveries. It, it just it gets very detailed. So if you're going to do a Lovecraftian setting in Earth, just be warned that if you've got a Lovecraft fan in, among your players, they are going to try to use other scenarios and other things happening concurrently to try to survive. And they should totally be allowed to do that because they live in that world. Mm -hmm. Oh, as the, as the player. And it's going to feel bad as the DM when they do something to derail your campaign and you don't know exactly what it is they just did. So it's better to use Lovecraftian elements to bring into your own homebrew world. That way you don't have extraneous circumstances happening. They say, enable the sacrifice of Cthulhu to summon Aster instead and wipe out the Guardian once and for all. Or get killed as the sacrifice of Cthulhu, but then find out, uh, but then have already ingested a, a small measure of that immortality serum. And instead, resurrect as an all-knowing, immortal being. But hey, there's a lot of things they could do that could just completely wreck the campaign with uh, all the Lovecraft war that just happens all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, one uh, event that I saw that's really popular because um, a lot of people, when I was doing the research, I, I, especially on YouTube, um, is like, be careful of how many times you say his name, because you'll alert him to your presence. Well, uh, when Aldron is on the horizon and you say his name three times, you're supposed to be summoned to Carcosa. Um, and uh, so that's even a possibility to get uh, your characters away from Earth. It's like, oh, this is not really going to happen, and it, it does. I, uh, I have Carcosa as a plane. In my <clears throat> planar wheel system. Not planar spheres. Not all planes are accessible to all planes. Most planes are on the outside of the wheel and are only accessible to the planes immediately adjacent to them. So one in front and one in back. And then of course the one in the center is the astral plane. Connected to all planes at once, and all planes are connected to it. But Carcosa is indeed one of them. I know it's really interesting. It was it's Carcosa is kind of like, in a way, the the sky and stuff like that is kind of reversed because the stars are dark and the sky is bright. Just think of it like a Dalmatian sky. Yes, very much a Dalmatian sky. And if you take them into another plane from Earth. Like, you could, a lot of people, um, do not like to question stuff, uh, especially, like, the, uh, like, going on of the world. So, like, gravity is different, or, uh, you know, um, uh, the sun doesn't rise every day, or... Um, just... Oh, if we're going to get into physics issues... Extra moon. Yeah. I love instances where players have decided to go to a place. I'm like, due to the pressure and temperature here, your the moisture begins to boil out of your eyeballs and your blood starts to form hot in the air. You're dying. <laughs> All you have to do is reduce atmospheric pressure, say, plane of vacuum, very quick death. I feel like something like that would belong in a sci-fi campaign. Or any campaign, like in a Lovecraftian setting, where the monsters come from space. That is true. 
in a way that's still sci-fi right mm -hmm. guys lovecraft is cosmic horror it is yeah um so is doom another interesting thing for uh the nerds Alien out there the nerds out there is uh doctor who could definitely be meshed up with the lovecraftian warrior hmm. all right all right they've tapped into doctor that. who is near left think he? about it he's the decider of everything humanity's done he decides who's in charge he brings up what gets to be an empire and what doesn't he decides what aliens get to stay there. I mean, I can, but he usually says he doesn't. And he causes many people to go and say, perfect example, Rose's grandpa. Rose's grandfather? I don't even remember that guy. He was oh, insane. and then we, uh, we also come to the fact that our, our good buddy, the doctor, Nara Lethetep, who is quite frankly and quite possibly the Yellow King, Manages to get himself a slavery pensions archenemy for a while. Interesting. Oh, and where do you think he meets and awakens this said enemy? In space? No, no, in the deep, in, in some kind of like deep submarine world that was about to be destroyed in space. Oh, so for those Doctor Who fans out there, maybe uh, Lovecraft versus Doctor Who? You could explore that a little bit too, because isn't there a system for Doctor Who as well? I yeah. I know that there's Gallifreyan as a character or as a player race. I guess kind of, but I guess the closest thing we ever came to was like the Beast in the Pit, which basically bad like Doctor Who fighting like this devil type creature who was around since before time began. So I guess that's kind of Lovecraftian. Yep, but the big question would have been the Beast in the Pit. I didn't know enough about that creature, other than it was evil, apparently. Also, it was Satan. Yeah, what, but what really was it? I it mean, identified Satan. itself as just, just evil. It was like, I'm evil. I'm everything evil that's ever been. Really? You sure about that? You're a concept, and we put you in real chains. What kind of fucking science voodoo is this? <laughs> I, would, I just want to point out that first off, that belies metaphysics, like nano metaphysics, in a scientific level. So imagine this. And then this is the way I would sci fi explain it, if, if you will. So you got nanobots in the air, right? And you got these people that learn how to use them to do quote unquote magical effects, like heat them up and you fireball. Or you, you can take away the energy and you can, like, make them all stand still. It's like old person. So what if there were these people who could externalize and manifest their emotions as hideous, unrealistic, horrible-looking creatures? Just truly terrifying, horrible things made from the twisted and anguished emotions of this strange kind of nano-mage. I would call them a metaphysicist. Because they very realist, they very literally in, like, embodied their emotions or their feelings into a creature that they can then use as a weapon. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, so you can attack people with your, your hatred. So, like, what if this was a society manifesting all of their concepts of evil into a real physical creature? Yeah, it explains why it's so powerful. But uh, probably should have been able to. Right. Like, why did they why just need to lock it up in this chamber here? Was it just like one of their sick twists? They're like, hey, look, this is the thing that we created to be the ultimate evil so we could throw our drinks at it. What was its purpose? Because we could. I guess. I mean, yeah, we could. But c that's interesting, too, because can you actually even defeat it? And if you're just throwing, like, drinks and stuff at it, doesn't it make it stronger because it feeds the hatred? And just the concept of everyone thinking that it's all fun and dandy and stuff like that. And when it actually gets out, 
the true terror begins because you know you've done wrong against your own anger. It's got a lot of implications. Lots of fun things for the characters to try to figure out for themselves. I haven't, I didn't used to be such a, a sci-fi person, but I think it's changing a lot now. Because of all the awesome new video games coming out. <laughs> and Cyberpunk has just recently did a new um, edition, too. And Starfinder. A lot of things are shifting towards space. I can see that a little bit. Then again, I'm not sure if Cyberpunk has anything to do with space. And again, I don't know much about cyberpunk. Uh, well, cyberpunk is like a more of a modern type of RPG. It's usually uh, takes place in modern era. I thought it's um, futuristic. Thought, uh, like, uh, kind of like early '90s concept <laughs> of 2020. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. The risen. Uh, if you want an RPG out in space, I'd probably recommend Outer Worlds. Now, if we want to talk D and D lore, I could go on quite a rant about the Rizidun. Oh, and if we wanted to link it to Lovecraft, Rizidun is Azathoth. He is the the great blind dumb god, or and they call him in uh, in D and D. They've they've got a couple names for that. Uh, it's said that the Rizidun is out, is also Dendar, the one the lizard folk uh, claim will come and eat the sun and end the world. But uh, the, the way that it goes is the Rizidun was the name that the gods knew him by. He was a fellow of theirs, like one of them. They knew him, but at the same time, his powers were indescribably different and more dangerous to them. Because the Rizidun was the master of two planes. He controlled the planes of, what was it, creativity and creation. Where he was, he could simply imagine things into being. Kind of broken, considering that the next runner-up was Asmodeus. So, like, I'm I'm Big Devil. Oh, I can make anything. I can make more of you. That's not fair. <laughs> yeah, it's said that they were able to trick him into basically creating a mini-verse inside of his own plane and just going in and living in that. Not realizing that theirs was completely Thrizidunless at that point. So Thrizidun's just trapped in a dream, in a way. He's trapped in a mini verse of his own creation that he forgot he actually went. Which means that all the gods that knew him are terrified that he's going to find out someday and realize that they tricked him and just completely wipe them all out. Apparently, he wasn't one for betrayal. As most gods aren't. So, yep, you've got this, like, all-powerful, crazy creator god thing that's that's trapped in a prison of its own making. In most D&D universes, that's just the Rizidu. He's, he's hanging out down there in the bottom of the abyss, conceptually, because there's no true bottom. Yeah, he says really close to a, like, as a sauce, like you said. So... Yeah, he, you know, the, the god that's in its own dream and distracted by its personal army of, of dancers. Yeah. And here's a good question. For a god who can create anything and uh, will it into bring, being, um, what would they create? And more importantly, how what's the link to from that to beholders? Well, even more importantly, this thing that they're running down there, the miniverse, it's not like it's an illusion. It is its own universe. You've got something going on in there. Let's go even further on that concept. What if it's not a trap? What if the Rizidun was never trapped? What if the Rizidun's just not from your universe? What if he's an outer creature? See, the only way an outer creature can come into a universe first is it, it, it's too insanely difficult for it to try to get in. By directly jumping in, it has to go through this this infinite conceptual void, it's unbreachable. <clears throat> but maybe if it's able to send out sort of an idea of itself, sort to start to lay out the blueprints for itself conceptually in that, see if it can even exist there. 
in a way that it could be accepted. What if Garizadu never existed, but using his power has forged a delusion in the minds of those gods to fear him and to know him as if he were part of their history? So that someday, when the connection is strong enough, he can make the jump. And suddenly, their universe will collide with his. Oh my God. I'm just saying, what if it's not that he was actually there through history? What if that's another universe trying to lay out a fishing line? Say, <laughs> someone bites, it's going to try to reel you in. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the personal homebrew lore I've got, that's exactly how June interacts with other universes. So it's perfect that that's pre-written into the D&D lore of most worlds, because it means June can attach just about anything. You just make it, so that that prison that uh, Beresadun is in is June. And it's not a prison. Just his world. Oh my gosh. So much fun stuff for you guys to try. My Tuesday games now. I've slightly added Haster into my game. And I'm just wondering how it will work out. It was just like a small trial thing. But I think it worked out so good so far. Because is it... The question is, was it just one outer god that was um with in that in that bar or was it more? That's a terrible question. How many outer gods can you fit into a bar? <laughs> That's the We've officially D and D trivialized the outer gods. No, uh um, right, how many outer gods can I fit into a tavern? That sounds like a a good joke, actually. It sounds like a good party game. Yes. Now there's going to be like D and D, Lovecraft collector cards. I play Cthulhu face down. I play Cthulhu. <laughs> we should actually make a party game. How many uh, outer gods can we fit into a, a tavern? That would be a great game. <laughs> Another blast. Four outer gods. We never give them a break. Right. But I think it wraps up. For about this uh this uh first episode, uh do you guys have anything else you guys want to say? Thank uh, you for listening. Listen. Oh yes, thank you very much for listening. We really appreciate it. And uh, subscribe if you would like to hear more about tabletop stuff in the future. Um, I'm particularly skilled at homebrew, um, five E, and I'm I'm working on Call of Cthulhu, um. Sam, what systems are you good at? Oh, uh, <clears throat> I'm I'm almost exclusive to fifth edition at this point. I like to do I, I'm the new stuff, Wizards of the Coast fanboy. Uh, but I also like to make my players cry. I got many different methods for doing it, but I, I like to make my players cry. So we're gonna... okay. Yeah, you do too. She does so well. Not always in bad ways. No, no. But we will tell you content from our own games, and we will theorize some stuff from our own experiences that we had. Thank you very much for listening, and have a good day. All right.